Let me say good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being with us with Tap India. And for those of you who don't know what Tap India is, it's the art platform India. And uh, the idea is to engage, to uh, connect, and to educate people. So we have a group of galleries that have got together. So there is a commercial section and there is a non-commercial section. The non-commercial section obviously is all the talks that we've been doing, which have been very, very well received. And we've had two talks a month. And uh, just for those of you who want to stay on our mailing list, please go to our events and our website, which is the artplatformindia.com and go to the event section and register so that we have your name and we put you on our mailing list. Otherwise, uh, we always send out invitations and uh, with the links that come in at the last minute, even if you have not registered. So welcome everybody. Uh, this talk originated when my very good friend and old friend Anna from school actually and my friend from college we started talking about wellness and art since we all have come from an art background and we talked about what she's been doing in Canada and that's how this talk originated so Anna thank you very much and thank you all for being here and for agreeing to do this absolutely wonderful talk I know it's going to be wonderful and it's very timely I think because we all need it a lot of people have gone through these 18 months in a, with a very mixed reaction uh, because you know you know how difficult it's been across the world. So over to Anna, thank you. And the rest of us can please unmute and just mute yourself whenever you're talking. Thank you. My name is Anna Silgado. I'm founder of Artisan Momentum. We are the Starfish Collective, a group of artists that bring programming into the community. It's a very immersive, hands-on program. We want you to value your innate cultural heritage and bring your unique story into this program. This space is very open to everybody. You don't have to feel like you're being judged or you're mis being misunderstood. It's like a comfortable space where you can actually talk. No one could see the turmoil going inside my head because on the surface, I appeared normal. Kind of like woke me up. Like slowly, I was like waking out of slumber. I plowed the seeds of impatience and frustration and the daily stress. And I laid down the seeds of love, more happiness, and gratitude. I'm very happy to be here today celebrating AIM, Artists in Momentum, which has liberated and uplifted and inspired women. These are newcomers who have come to our community and through art it has given them so much empowerment. It's not all about prescription of medications. The program that Anna Silgardo started has great potential and more and more people are buying into it. Just listening today to what the ladies who participated in the program, how they felt about it, how they networked, how they felt the self-esteem improved. I think it has a huge impact. Then I got registered for this program and I met Anna. That's it, my life has changed from there. I could say it has changed. It has built confidence. I never knew I could do such great arts anytime. <laughs> I'm on cloud nine. <laughs> So hello everyone, um, it's wonderful to be here and you know I'm deeply gratified to all of you for taking time out of your Saturday to join us in this very important discussion. My name is Anna Silgado, I'm founder of Artisan Momentum and the Starfish Collective. A big shout out to the TAP India team under the leadership of uh, Sharan Aparao who has enabled this, okay? Sharon has been indefatigable in her mission to educate and inform. If I have to flip 42 years from when we were mere students, I would have to salute her ability to act on her innate resourcefulness to share the wonder of art. You know, it's almost surreal to know we are not in the same room, but we are sharing the same space some of us are thousands of miles away on another continent, 
And to me, this is such a valid and mind-blowing thought that our human spirit cannot be contained by geographical boundaries. This great spirit that dwells in all of us has incredible capacity. The singular and dynamic power that lies within each of us is so powerful that it can step outside boundaries into the unknown and dive into the colorless places of life to extricate the wonder of imagination and creativity. It has the capacity to empower and strengthen the individual while having a domino effect on the family and community to promote a feeling of well being. You know, this wonderful spirit, unfettered, is creative self expression and coined as art. So you may ask me, why am I so passionate about art and creative self expression? I believe that art forms the many letters in our DNA, chronicling our human narrative. It is vital to our existence. The therapeutic value of expression through painting, sculpting, dancing, writing, singing, acting, you name it, is fundamental and life-sustaining and cannot be understated. In the United Kingdom, an inquiry was conducted by the all-party parliamentary uh, group. Um, you can put that on the chat box, the link that I sent. See, I remembered. <laughs> In 2017, the report that uh, stated there was evidence of, and open quotes, uh, of a beneficial relationship between arts engagement, health and well-being across the life course. And uh, the report concluded that engagement in the arts can mitigate the social determinants of health by influencing many areas, included but not limited to mental health, child cognitive development, compensating for work-related stress, and building individual resilience and enhancing communities. We are here to discuss serious issues that affect all of us. Everyone is talking about mental health, but are we listening? Are our, you, are our ears tuned to the silence? Can we recognize the signs of loneliness and quiet desperation? Or do we just ignore it and hope it will all go away? In today's discussion, we hope you will take away some key insights into managing your own mental wellness while considering how engagement in the arts can help. After today's session, you will have the opportunity to take part in a two-day free workshop run by the Starfish Collective. Uh, the Starfish Collective is actually a group of artists that have come together and we deliver multifaceted art programming that is visual art, theater, movement, etc. So it will be held on Saturday, August 14th and 21st from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. IST. And through visual art, we will focus on your innate spirit of creativity to empower and build. And enough of me blathering on. So I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca now, who will introduce the panelists and get us going. Rebecca Durance Hines, way Rebecca, Hello. is a breast cancer th survivor, thriver, and host of I I'm Power. She's a versatile artist. Her art forms include acting, writing, and she shares a story and she has sustained herself through her mercurial journey through cancer. She's founder of Solace Cancer's community and her weekly uh, posts and blogs uh, range from diet to emotional health to new cancer research. She's producer and host of her own interview series. She has co-produced and co-hosted others which bring valuable information from experts to the field, uh, in the fields of mental and emotional and physical health, wellness and cancer care to the public. She's a supporter of the arts, otherwise she wouldn't be here. Rebecca is com committed to community self-care through engagement in the arts. Take it away, Rebecca. 
Thank you so much, Anna, for that introduction. And thank you, panelists and everybody uh, who is here today watching. And welcome to Hey, Let's Talk. And uh, so today we're going to be focusing on arts and creative expression and how they can support mental and emotional health. And I think everyone knows we have never needed these supports more than now. And so I'm just really excited that we're going to be able to bring this valuable information to everybody. So as Anna said, my name is Rebecca Durant Hine, and I will be your host, co-host and moderator for the session. Uh, and I, I am a breast cancer survivor and thriver. I'm a teacher, an actor, I'm a writer. <laughs> and yes, I founded Solus Cancer Community uh, to help give back and support uh, those going through cancer and those serious about prevention. So as a, an actor myself and a writer, I know how supportive the arts can be to mental and emotional health. And um, they, my art played a integral role in my healing after cancer. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so looking forward to uh, tonight's discussion. So before uh, I introduce our panel, I just wanted to remind everybody that we're going to leave some time at the end for a few questions and we won't be able to get to all of them most likely, but we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so throughout the session, if you could, uh, if you have a question, if you could just put it in the chat box and then uh, we'll go back through at the end and we'll pull those out. Um, so uh, yeah, so make sure that you do that throughout the session whenever you think of a question. So tonight I am honored to be joined by some amazing artists and mental health professionals and we'll be hearing from a couple of additional artists later in the program as well. Um, but joining me on the discussion panel are Anubhav Nath, Dr. Prabhachandra, Renu, uh, Renu Srinivasan and Col Dr. Colin Saldana. Anubhav is an artist and the director of Ohas Art, a gallery and arts initiative, and he's also the co-founder of the Ram Nath Foundation, a foundation that strives to restore art and promote art as a source of rehabilitation. Dr. Prabhachandra is a professor of psychiatry in the previous, uh, in the previous head of the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore, India. President-elect of the International Association of Women's Mental Health, she has served as consultant to the World Health Organization and UNAIDS. A former visiting professor at the University of Liverpool, UK, she is currently a nominated member of the Mission Steering Group of the National Health Mission, Government of India. Uh, on the editorial board of several international journals, she has been heralded as a champion of women's mental health in India by Lancet Psychiatry. And Renu Srinivasan is an emotional counselor, an academic auditor, and a teacher trainer. Her education in special learning disabilities has her adept in her current role as counselor, where she caters to age groups ranging from 16 all the way up to 70. Her abilities cover a wide scope of issues from grief and depression to concerns related to academics, workshops for adolescents, parenting, peel counseling, and utilizing highly concentrated skills in change management. And finally, Dr. Colin Saldana is a family physician in Mississauga, Ontario, where he has a long and distinguished history of public service and a staunch advocate for the marginalized members of society, um, primarily in the areas of social justice and mental health. And as chair of the Public Policy Committee of the United Way of Region Peel, he has initiated a non-pharmacological approach to mental health. Recently inducted into Mississauga's Legends Row and recipient of a papal knighthood, he is committed to serving the needs of the community. And so a very heartfelt welcome and thank you to everybody here uh, on our discussion and thank you, our discussion panel, thank you for joining us today. So the first part, we're going to just split our discussion into two parts today. So uh, the first part is going to be focusing on mental health stigma and COVID specifically in terms of its effect on, on mental health. Um, so the, the first question I would like to start with, I mean, uh, one, one good thing about COVID, which and there's not too many of them, but one good one is that, um, you know, it's gotten a lot more people thinking about and talking about their own mental health and the mental health of their loved ones. But there's still a lot of stigma that exists around mental health. And so I'd like to sort of start with a question that, that um, anyone can feel free to jump in on. I will direct a question to you specifically if I think perhaps it's one that you are best suited to answer. But um, for this first one, yeah, if anyone would like to jump in on this, um, would anyone like to speak about the ways that you have seen mental health stigma expressed and the effects that that has had on people? And feel free to comment on also how you think we can maybe improve this stigma and increase the access that people have to, to mental health supports. So feel free to unmute yourself and jump on in. Hi, may I start? 
Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you so much for having me on this panel and uh, it's really exciting. Um, so in terms of stigma, I think that one of the biggest problems is um, the kind of labels that people with mental health uh, problems get. There is a lot of um, diffidence related to the labels and people don't like being labeled as having a disorder necessarily. So I think it's about that because once you have that label, then there is uh, all the baggage that goes with it. So I think um, that's a huge, huge problem that I find uh, you know, people have. And I think stigma also prevents uh, help seeking in a big way. Um, and and I, to me that, that it delays help seeking. Uh, people don't like, um, and, and I completely understand why people may not like coming to large institutional setups and prefer sort of the more smaller counseling kind of services because there is less stigma in, in those uh, locations. So I think um, to my mind, stigma is about both stigma that is uh, from external sources, as well as internalized stigma that people with mental health problems face. And I think when we want to handle stigma, we need to sort of approach it uh, both ways. Yeah, both ways. That's very interesting. Yeah, because uh, it, it's so true, right? We do internalize a lot of things and um, that you know, was an aspect of it that really hadn't occurred to me before. So that's a really important point to bring up that there are two sides to that stigma for sure. Does anybody else um, want to add any comments about uh, stigma and how you've seen it uh, affect people? Oh, you're you're muted, Dr. Saldana. I'll ask you to unmute. If you could just un unmute yourself. Right. There you go. Okay, here. Well, I just want to pick up on Dr. Chandra's point. As a family physician and doing a lot of telemedicine during COVID, you begin to see that those pre-existing conditions of people with anxiety, stress, as you can imagine, within the realm of mental health, there's a spectrum from the low end of anxiety to the significant end of bipolar uh, conditions. But as a family physician here in Canada, and having the opportunity to see people from different communities, immigrant communities, uh, the stigma is even more prevalent in terms of suppressing uh, the diagnosis, uh, accessing services as opposed to the, the Caucasian community, so to say. And so I think creating that awareness uh, is important within communities and how families can support those who have or recognize uh, conditions that they bring it to the fore to the attention. I think Dr. Chandra mentioned about um, the diffidence to accessing uh, counseling services. I think in, at least uh, speaking from a North American perspective, the family physician is always the conduit where they tend to make the referrals. So if you don't come forward to the family physician, you don't tend to get access to those services. Mm -hmm. So creating the awareness within families, not necessarily only within the individual, uh, is, is a huge. And I'll speak later about the role that family plays in terms of um, opening the window and the opportunities to management of patients with, with. So COVID has definitely created it, but the issues have been suppressed. Definitely, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, Renu, did you have something to add? Yeah, uh, no, uh, I, I can speak from my perspective as a counselor of a, a counseling, counseling organization about talking about how stigma is expressed in our counseling sessions. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to know people, very educated people who get referred by psychiatrists or other physicians and say, okay, you don't, you just have a transient emotional issue that is happening. There's no real need for medication as such, they come and they sit down and they say, you know what, I don't know why I'm here. My psychiatrist told me or my doctor told me or my parents told me, I'm fine. I don't shout. I'm not violent. Nothing's wrong with me, but I really don't know why I'm here. Interestingly, when I was interning in a hospital, parents had brought in a young adult who has who had bipolar because that was diagnosed by the psychiatrist and what she came and said 
I am not violent like the other people. Why am I here? So this is how the stigma. I mean, my experience about how stigma is expressed in our community setup. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank please. you for giving this opportunity. Also. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. And so, yeah, these stigmas or these stereotypes, I, I suppose, right. get built up. Yeah. But Anubhav, did you want to add? Yeah. Uh, firstly, a big thank you to everyone. Rebecca, there's a little edit on my bio. Uh, oh, yeah. I am, everything that you said was absolutely correct, just that I'm not an artist. Not in this uh, birth. Maybe my next birth, I will be one. <laughs> this birth, I'm not accomplished enough. So just, um, though, of course, I do doodle. And during COVID, that's been something that's really kept me going and a lot of people I know going. Uh, so another, uh, you know, another perspective I wanted to get was, um, I'm also, I wear another hat where I'm a trustee at the Salam Balak Trust, where we look after, you know, uh, about 500 street and working children, and we reach out to about 10,000. So uh, I want to say that, you know, we all know that there, in the Indian context, there has been a big stigma related to mental health, which was even there before COVID in a very big way, it's nothing new. But I feel that during this whole COVID pandemic, during this, there is much more awareness and openness among people to talk about mental health issues per se. Uh, reason being because everyone is going through something or the other, like some variation at some degree. So in a way, I think people are just being more open and talking about the therapist they go to or the fact that they are in therapy versus being very cagey about it. And, uh, you know, what was very welcoming to me was that uh, uh, a few of my friends contacted me, got in touch with me because um, at the trust, we have a very, very active mental health program. We have an entire team dedicated to mental health uh, for the children. And I had a few friends of mine get in touch with me and they were like, you know, we've been in therapy and it's been really helpful for us. And we know that the Salam Bala Trust does mental health, has a very pioneering mental health program. And we would want to support this program. So to me, that was really heartening to see that certain stigmas are getting broken for these people to talk to me about their own uh, therapy, you know, that they are in therapy, and then wanting to support a mental health program. That's really wonderful to hear. Yeah. And um, must be very yeah, refreshing and very nice. Exactly. To hear so it's like, it's really it. changed in the last one and a half years. I feel there's been a change in the whole uh, lens with which people look at the mental health space. That's really wonderful to hear. And um, on, on that, that note of, um, you know, seeking more supports for mental health, we know that, um, you know, COVID has caused a lot of things like, you know, phobias and panic and PTSD yeah. and trauma and anxiety and, and all of these things. Um, Renu, this may be a good one for you to, to jump in on first, but anyone can add as well. Um, why do you feel that this pandemic, especially the, the second waves and third waves, these additional waves that are happening, why have they weighed sort of, you know, exponentially more heavy on people and affected their mental and emotional well-being in ways that, you know, maybe other events in the past um, haven't, you know, maybe what have you seen in your clinic about, uh, about that? Yeah, actually what's happened is in the first wave, there was a lot of fear. People were very careful. The lockdown was yeah, uh, followed very meticulously. And second wave came along. The big difference was between the first wave and second wave, people had become a little relaxed. But when the second wave actually came in, it affected every family. In the first wave, we had heard only about some families being affected. Whereas actually, even in my family, my mother, who is 91 years old, also got affected by COVID. And it seemed too close for us. And we have calls coming in uh, in our center where people had lost their husbands, people had lost parents, people, children had lost at least one parent. And all this made them extremely anxious, extremely afraid. What it, if it comes closer? What if we don't get medical health, uh, help because there are so many cases happening? This was one of the major things that made it much more after the second uh, pandemic. And of course, our fear, anxiety, stress. In addition to that, we have many students also coming in, young, I mean, college students who say, what do we do? One and a half years, we've not had 
regular college school and uh, where does our future go what is the uncertainty the third the kind, the kind of uh, people who come third category of people who come is people who have lost employment or on the verge of losing employment they have reduced salaries so they are extremely anxious about how they are going to manage in such a situation so these are mainly the three main reasons why in the second pandemic it has really uh, multiplied 10x or 20x i do not know but it has really multiplied yeah thanks yeah, thanks um, rebecca yes yeah thank you for for sharing that information yeah um <clears throat> And I think too, uh, uh, this one might be a good one for you, Dr. Chandra. I, COVID is on, uh, I think one of the factors that have affected people mentally and emotionally is that social aspect because um, COVID's obviously eliminated uh, much of that social aspect of support for people due to all of the restrictions. Um, and uh, traditional grieving practices in India, of course, have been put on hold as well. People can't gather, um, I mean, all over the world, really. Um, and so can you speak about the impact that an inability to grieve properly through the, that gathering in those traditions, how, what, what effect do you feel like that's had on people during the pandemic? And is there something that we can maybe do to remedy this grieving process moving, moving forward into yeah, the situation that we're still in? Uh, thanks, Rebecca. I think it's, it's such an important uh, area. I think COVID sort of has, has taken us all by surprise because even for professionals like me who sort of, you know, have a lot of experience, this is something that we have never experienced. We've never experienced this uncertainty. We've never experienced a time when people can't meet each other, can't hug each other, um, you know, uh, and, and sort of can't have gatherings. It's, it's a new narrative. And I don't think we didn't have it in our books. So we had to also, even as professional, even as mental health professionals, we had to completely evolve a new method of treatment, therapy, you know, a lot of tele stuff like Dr. Saldana mentioned, um, which sort of takes away the, the humanness a little bit. Uh, and so how to, how to add that element of uh, humanness into something which is so technical and, you know, um, so, so I think that's one issue that I want to highlight that even for professionals, it's not been easy. And um, we see a lot of health professionals coming in for help as well, because they have been struggling with how to provide support. In terms of grief, I think one of the things that has been talked about uh, in COVID times is what is called disenfranchised grief which basically means that grief that is not publicly acknowledged, a uh, grief that does not get the kind of support that it should get. So in some ways, it's a kind of grief which didn't, again, grief is so cultural. You know, you, you when someone passes away, you get together, you, uh, you talk about the person, you have mourning rituals, none of which was possible. And, and we, um, we did not have alternative methods of, of doing it. Uh, many people I know had sort of these um, Zoom uh, sort of gatherings and memorials, but many people felt that that was not acceptable to them. Uh, many of them could not do the kind of uh, rituals that they needed to do. So there's a lot of um, blocked grief, which is going on. The other thing is when a lot of people are dying, you know, around you, your friends, your relatives, many people passing away, there's a certain sense of weariness which comes in. And after a while, it's like, you can't grieve anymore. It's just too much, you know? So I think a lot of people have kept it aside. They have not grieved adequately. And I worry and I uh, fear that it will all come up later because they have not processed their grief. Um, you know, I have uh, people coming to me saying, you know, we had to get on and do things because I was the only one who was allowed in the hospital. I was only one who was allowed to do the burial or crem cremation. And um, I had to do a lot of practical stuff. So I didn't have any time to cry. I didn't have any time to grieve. So I think there's been a lot of unprocessed uh, grief uh, among people and, and, and a lot of disenfranchised kind of grief, which uh, the likes of which I don't think we've ever seen before. Yeah. yeah. Wow, yeah, and, and um, I think important to what, what you said about 
um, that sort of building up and it getting suppressed and then causing more issues down the line. And, and I think that's, you know, probably something that we run into with mental health a lot in terms of what we were discussing before with stigma and things like that. That's, I think it's all wrapped up in that. And I think COVID has just, you know, made it worse because as you said, there's so many practical things to handle. And when you're dealing with mental health issues, it makes dealing with those practical things so much more difficult. So it's easier to kind of shove them down. So yeah, so that you can move on and um, they can, they can come up later in ways that, you know, that ca can cause so many problems for us later on. So thank you for touching on that. It's an important thing to be aware of. Um, my, my big concern yeah. about this really is that it's of course about the fear, the unknown, but uh, once things open up, uh, whether the professionals will have the capacity to deal with some of these issues that are coming forward. Uh, I know, unfortunately, here the, we have this huge backlog anyway in managing psychiatry. Uh, but I think whether there's be some kind of medium or opportunity or or um, access to services is so important because we can see this happening. Very much picking up the point, the point of bereavement only the immediate family was allowed. And I was just dealing with a call three days ago with a young man, 35 years, who was grieving for his mother, uh, who died during the peak of the COVID. And there was just no family mm -hmm. other than his father mm -hmm. and himself who went to bury the mother. And that intimacy of the personal contact is now manifesting itself through sleeplessness, palpitations, anxiety, fear on the unknown. So my caution and concern is when things do open up, how are we going to manage this at different levels? That's right. Yeah. Important to bring up because, yeah, getting through the pandemic is one thing, but then all of the effects of it afterwards. And yeah, we, we don't even know yet what all of the effects are going to be on people long term. So that's also something very important to keep in mind and to be aware of, too. Um, so before we wrap up this portion of this discussion, um, I think it's important that we touch on, you know, the mental health of our children and youth, because I think this is, you know, probably affecting them in, in different ways um, that we maybe aren't seeing. So um, anyone can feel free to jump in here. Dr. Saldana, it might be a good time for you to talk about the family um, family aspect that you were discussed before, brought up before. So, but just how do you feel, you know, COVID's affecting our children and youth in the community that perhaps adults are maybe not seeing or understanding and, and how can we support them best? So I think within the youth spectrum, I think there's the, the isolation that's taking place. Kids not in school. Somebody mentioned about the uncertainty about their educational future, missed years. Um, unearthing, like I mentioned about this young man who was grieving for his mother, but she's grieving in isolation. Um, so there's this whole spectrum out there. And I think it's important for families to be aware. What we are talking about here, we are talking as artists, as health professionals. I think the message has to get out to primary care physicians, to social workers. Uh, and the inf information is not as robust out there in terms of family physicians or, or social workers about the importance of intervening. Uh, I'm afraid that here in, in North America, we tend, to, we tend to be quick in prescribing medication. And one of the things that I've been proponing, a proponent of is the non-pharmacological aspects of trying the recreational piece, the, the, the art piece, uh, the sports piece, trying to get, make sure that people, because as we know that the endorphins are released through this process and there's a hormonal changes in all of this. So getting the message out is important. And we, like I said, uh, this is going to create the kind of overburden on the system that the system has to be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely a huge issue. And I think at university level, um, uh, Reno will probably see that more at, at a university setting than some of us, but we see it more in the high school setting where there's uh, frustration and, and a lot of anguish. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any, anybody else want to add anything to this section of the discussion before we, before we move on? Um, Rebecca, so, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing this study currently in, uh, in children and families in Bangalore in low income settings. It's called the Bangalore Child Health and Development Study, which is it's like a cohort. We've been following these kids up for the last five years. They are six years old now. 
and uh, these are low-income families, so there, there's no online schooling happening. Uh, parents are struggling with debts and loans, and many of them are really depressed. And, and the kids are, uh, and we do like a very systematic assessment of the children all over the phone, of course, um, about how the kids are doing. And parents are really concerned about behavioral problems in the kids. Some kids are very anxious and are withdrawing. Some kids are acting out. There's an immense concern about mobile phone use. Um, because that seems to be the only way the kids are getting entertainment and, and a lot of concern about excessive uh, screen use. So I think that even the younger children um, are really struggling. And, and I don't think, like Dr. Saldana mentioned, I don't think that we are really paying enough attention to some of the preventive aspects of mental health as well. Um, I mean, these are kids who can probably benefit greatly from other forms of you know, sending worksheets, getting art done. I think the privileged schools are doing that, but the government schools and the low income schools are really not doing it enough. And, and there's a great opportunity uh, to do this. Uh, and I was talking to a policymaker yesterday about this and, you know, saying that really this is what we are finding. So before the children uh, have more damage and um, develop more behavioral problems or emotional problems because they're seeing parents struggling as well. So one is that they don't have peers. So normally children regulate, regulate their emotions by playing or games or school. Now they can't regulate those emotions. So those emotions are just all over the place. So I think there are huge issues in the future. When this generation grows up, there are huge issues as well. And I think we need to be cognizant of that. Absolutely. Yeah, very important point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, okay, great. So uh, thank you so much for your contribution so far to the discussion. And I just want to remind everyone watching one more time to um, keep putting your questions in the chat box if you have them. And again, we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, so we're just going to take a short break from the discussion right now to hear from two really wonderful artists about their art forms and how the arts have supported their mental health over the years. So please join me in welcoming Lata Pada and Christine Long. Lata Pada is the founder and artistic director of Sam Pradya Dance Creations, an award-winning Canadian dance company. She also heads the Sam Pradya Dance Academy. Lada has had an extensive international career and holds an MFA in dance from York University. Lada is also a recipient of the Order of Canada in 2009 and has the distinction of being the first South Asian artist to receive this prestigious national honor. Lada has also received many prestigious awards for her outstanding contributions to the arts. And Christine Long is an artist and co-chair of the Art Trends Collective. She's worked in museums, in the business world, the not-for-profit sector, and for many years in mood disorders associated with childbirth. On a normal day, engaged in the normal activity of walking across a car park, she felt something rip in her brain. Resulting in immediate hospitalization while the medical team reviewed her case, Christine was left paralyzed. And the stroke affected her vision and her speech, leaving her with an acute feeling that her life had come to an absolute grinding halt. The knowledge of brain plasticity in her research during rehabilitation motivated her to engage in the arts and she used art as a healing tool to help rewire her brain and improve her motor control. She relearned how to walk and talk while art continued to open her mind and vision to incredible possibilities and now she shares her joy of art by providing adult finger painting classes. Her students have included stressed out artists who need to loosen up and people with brain and mobility issues. So tap team, if you could now please play our videos from both Lada and Christine. simply walked across a parking lot and felt something rip in my brain. It didn't hurt, but over the next three days, I started to walk to one side, ended up in the hospital, um, and they really didn't know what it was. Within a few days, um, the whole my whole right side um, was really paralyzed. I was confused. I was distressed. There was one night when I almost died, and I have a great church family and I have great friends, I have a great husband. And I thought, 
I have a son and I want to see him live. I had a really good neurologist who said, you have something called CIS, clinically isolated syndrome, which is the very, very beginning part of MS. I got moved into the rehab and the fight began. We had an art teacher come and she just taught us some basic skills. And I thought I've never done art. Although it was in my family, um, I thought, I can't draw worth a darn and I can't use my right arm, but I thought, okay, I can use my left. So that's how art came into my life. I think the grace of God to me is an important series because I was trying to figure out what the colors of God are. So each one of those pieces was showing a different aspect of what God was like and also what some of the Psalms were like. One of the pieces that surprised me the most uh, was the piece you were fearfully and wonderfully made. When I looked at it, I went, that's Psalm 132. One of the other paintings or pieces I did was one called Pure Joy. That one uh, was one that came to me after Easter one time. What I saw was just streams and streams and streams of running water. A huge marsh filled with animals and birds and reeds and flowers. It was on something called terra skin, which is hard to paint on, but it was just exuberant. My name is Chris Long and I'm a visual artist. And I really believe that art can improve, change and um, add to your life in ways that you won't even know until you try. So God bless, keep going, don't give up and blessings on your day. It was an ordinary day. I was rehearsing. The phone rang. The phone rang on an ordinary day when I was rehearsing. On an ordinary day, the phone rang. I was rehearsing. I was rehearsing when the phone rang. It was an ordinary day. It was an ordinary day. I was rehearsing. The phone rang. The phone rang. The phone rang.
you placed my foot upon the rock for steadfastness, seven steps into the fire. Hello, I am Lata Pada, Artistic Director of Sampradaya Dance Creations. I do believe that society's engagement in the arts is vital for mental wellness. Thank for sharing a part of their journeys with us. That was, uh, it was really wonderful to see. Um, so as we come back to our panelist uh, discussion, just another reminder that during this next section, if any more questions occur to you, please put them in the chat box. And again, we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. Um, so this next section um, of our discussion is going to be focusing on the therapeutic impact of the arts on mental health. Um, and I'd like to... Uh, come back to Dr. Saldana here, because you were speaking before the break about these non-pharmacological approaches to uh, treating patients who are suffering with mental health issues. And um, could you just speak a little bit about, um, a little bit more about these, about these non-pharmacological approaches, maybe social prescribing, um, and just sort of the benefits that we can see from these, these approaches? So, yeah, happy to do that. Uh, I think the artists have recognized the impact and the beneficial consequences of integrating art in, in, in mental health. The body of evidence, like Dr. Chandra said, exists. The question is, how do we marry the two and make it happen? I think the body of evidence exists in both scenarios. And I think that's the huge gap that here, that in my own practice, I'm trying to, to create. And I see young men, women, children coming over to the office. And when you take a good history, you begin to realize the deficiencies and the need for other interventions. And I can quite categorically state that in my own practice, I make sure that I look for opportunities that where people can, can get out of their anxiety and depression in ways that does not include prescribing a medication the recreational component, the walks in the park, listening to music, the dance, the theater. And one of the important things is that when I bring them back into my practice and I say, what ask them, what are their interests? And if they don't have any interest, then I try to guide them based on what their family interests might be with a bit. And then you bring them back in, in a month's time and tell them to chart out what they've done and what they've achieved. I was reading some studies, one of them coming out from Drexel University in Philadelphia, where the nursing department did a great study trying to demonstrate the interaction of people without medication and the use of uh, art therapy. And they found that cortisol levels were decreased by 75% just within 45 minutes of entering into an unstructured art therapy. Wow. So I don't think my colleagues uh, as physicians are aware of the impact that this exists. And so as I started out, I began to spread the word around, but the upkeep unfortunately is not there. And sometimes art can be expensive for some kind of people. We, I think Anna and myself and a few others are trying to create an awareness here that the government would be able to give us more funding and showing the benefit of uh, social prescribing as an intervention in the minimizing and the prevention and the delay of the onset of, uh, of mental illness prescribing. Because the number of medications we prescribe are just at its limit. And I think that needs to be scaled back and we need to intervene from other touch points. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more because obviously uh, medications have their place. Absolutely. But um, people are still suffering. And um, it's, it sounds very promising, um, the, the research that you were discussing about ways that people can support their own, their own mental health through these other avenues. So that's, that's pretty exciting. And um, one of the points that I want to just comment on it is there is low self-esteem, mostly in people with mental health. Mm -hmm. And when they engage in activities where they can demonstrate some personal successes, however small they might be, that's a reinforcement of the work that they're doing. One of the projects that Anna was involved in, we saw the video earlier and I was a speaker at that event, was the sense of tremendous fulfillment, excitement that the uh, single mothers and new immigrants were involved in. They did it as a group, so they benefit from the interaction. They benefited from the work that they did, that, wow, I can actually do this, paint, and, and then have an exhibition the reinforcement just doubled. And I think those are the kinds of interventions that have to be a little more structured in, 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 in uh, the medical management of patient, patients as opposed to keeping it as an isolation. So it's a great augmentative process to do. Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. Um, yes, any Yeah, uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about my experience at uh, Bihar Jail. This yes. was in 2006, 7, 8, 9, somewhere there, when uh, we, were, we did a long project there with uh, the young inmates, 18 to 21 year old inmates. And we used, we went in just using art as a tool for therapy. You know, there was no agenda, nothing. It was just about interacting with these young inmates and giving them paper and colors to draw with. You know, basically, that's it. No brief, nothing. And uh, just kind of, uh, you know, what uh, Dr. Saldana said, I remember that uh, uh, the inmates, the young inmates, they came up with such vivid artworks and it was so therapeutic for them. And, you know, I do remember it was, uh, I don't have formal, I don't have statistics on it. It was, yeah, thank you for this. Like that's, we later did an art exhibition also of the inmates works along with artist friend, you know, like the like contemporary artists who visited the prison with me. And uh, some of the artwork that came out was brilliant. I, I just, I shared this slide where uh, there was a lot of talk of, there were three things that came out again and again in their art. One was the concept of time because, you know, they were pretty much just waiting for their uh, cases to be held in court and things like that. So there was a lot of concept of time, spirituality, a lot of gods and goddesses and uh, uh, invocations that came out on canvas. And the third one being sexuality, artworks related to sexuality. Like and in this picture, I kind of got all three actually. So uh, because we, are, we were dealing with young men, 18 to 21 year old men, where their hormones are ticking, everything's happening. But I do remember the, uh, the uh, superintendents telling us that how the inmates were always really looking forward to these classes and how it was, it, it, it had helped in uh, just maintaining more peace in the prison with like lesser fights breaking out and things like that. And, you know, uh, now it's like the Delhi prisons, uh, the Tihar jail, which is, uh, it's a model prison in the Indian context. And uh, they have a lot of different NGOs working there and art has become a very big part of the prison's programming. And in fact, they've even opened an art gallery inside the prison now. Incredible, that's incredible to hear. Yeah. Um, just the effects that that's having, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and you know, so, uh, just one more thing uh, some of yeah. the artists that we worked with, uh, they went on to establish themselves as artists. That's amazing. As they, you know, so they went back to their villages and to their homes and they were able to like generate work by being artists over there. That's fantastic to hear. Um, and while, while we are with you, um, could you talk a little bit about just about, about what else, because it's related to this, um, mm -hmm. uh, this example that you've just been giving, this is a really wonderful example. Um, just a, 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 yeah, a brief example or explanation rather of what outsider art is, because there may be some people watching who aren't right. familiar with that. Right. So, um, yeah, and how it can support people. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. outsider art is uh, the 
term outsider art originated in the 19, early 70s. Uh, it is essentially when uh, a, an English art critic, um, Roger Cardinal, he came up with this term of art, which was not mainstream, which was not done by artists, but by outsiders, as mm -hmm. the name suggests. At the same time, there was also, um, in France, this was referred to as art brut. And this, uh, you know, where it's brut art, it's untrained, basically. And this was um, headed by uh, Jean, an, a French artist, Jean, Jean de Buffon. I may be getting the pronunciations a little off. And uh, uh, so that was that. But so this is when these, point, these terms, these terminologies happen. But, you know, there has been right in the uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century, there had been interest in uh, a lot of art that came out of um, mental asylums. So basically it, and in Switzerland, there was a Swiss asylum and uh, Dr. Prinzen, Prinzen, who was a visionary or like really revolutionary in that sense, where he encouraged his patient to draw or to sketch or to do anything. Basically gave them paper, pen, pencil, etc., colors, and told them to just do whatever came to their mind. And some of these pieces that came out uh, these were like then later compiled in a book. And that book is supposed to have been a source of inspiration for a lot of surrealist artists. Mm -hmm. You know, because this happened, um, in fact, in the presentation, we have a work uh, from, I think, from the 1911, from 1911 by uh, an artist called Adolf, who is probably considered to be like the first out known outsider artist in that mm -hmm. sense. And uh, so, so this is like the beginning of outsider art, but today outsider art has gone to encompass, yeah. That's, that, that's the artwork I was referring mm -hmm. to by Adolf. So, you know, we can see where surrealism could be kind of um, inspired, if not inspired, maybe a stronger word, but would, could relate to this. Yes. You know, there is a resonance with surrealism when you see Adolf's mm -hmm. work. So uh, this was compiled in a book with like, hundreds of artwork. So uh, outsider art is now going to encompass a lot of art, which, you know, which don't have, which are difficult to be labeled and qualified. So why do we have these labels? I don't know, but I guess we just need these labels to kind of make things easier. Uh, so yeah, um, so now even like the tribal arts, you know, where basically the larger definition of outsider art is any sort of art, which is not, formally trained, any artist who's not formally trained, his or her work qualifies as outsider art. So uh, in the international sense, that even qualifies like a lot of tribal art that happens all over the world. And there are outsider art fairs that happen and people actually collect artworks, which are purely outsider, meaning they're not from artists who went to art school, essentially. Right. Right. And uh, so personally, my journey has also been in this category, you know, where we've been doing a lot of work with uh, with non-professionally trained artists that's tribal mm -hmm. and traditional artists within India. Yes. Yeah. And, and from the uh, example you gave with the inmates, it sounds like it um, can be very supportive. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it, it is very therapeutic. Like I said, you know, and during the pandemic, uh, there's been, uh, you know, coloring books, the yeah. uh, adult coloring books. Have a few. <laughs> <laughs> it's like everyone has an adult coloring book on yeah. their desk. And if you don't, please get one. It's really, really helpful to have one handy. And you know, any pencil, any colors, you don't even need anything. Um, I would like to share a, um, the art of my, uh, a very close uh, uncle, uh, Mr. Gautam Sabarwal. He's an advocate, he's a lawyer. And this was during the pandemic. He's, you know, he's also an art collector and he loves art per se. But during the uh, pandemic, he got into coloring. He got himself adult coloring books. And, but before that, he was uh, in his office where, uh, you know, he created this artwork with just oh pens, various colored pens on his office, in his office. And he did not even look at this as artwork. This is essentially a recording of the chanting that he does. Mm -hmm. So he chants to keep himself calm. And then he started, you know, creating this complex looking code with various colored pens and basically counting his chanting. And now, uh, so this is, uh, I want to say, this is one of his first one. And um, he gives, I, I pretty much like got two of them from him and I've framed them and put them up in my house because I just think they're so beautiful. 
and is. now he's gone on to he's graduated to making really complex designs and layouts uh, which correspond to uh, indian mythology wow. you know so That's it's like nice. it's everywhere it's just how you put it together yeah. and uh, at some point i think i really uh, i've been talking to him and i'm like we must show you you know because it just happened during covid and it's just so beautiful and the world must see this yeah and can i uh, sorry uh, rebecca no, i ahead, just wanted to interrupt here because um i uh, i know i'm not a panelist but uh, um as uh, it's it's, a, it's a conversation event. we are having it's yeah, a conversation. <laughs> so i just want to make and we did say it's going to be informal I did want to draw uh, Dr. Prabha into this because I remember watching an episode of yours where you were talking about um, something that is being done in the villages. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, could you please touch on that uh, in case we completely miss on that, you know, during this conversation? I did want to share that with the rest of the yeah. participants. First of all, thanks Anubha for that wonderful, you know, discussion about outsider art, and and I think it's um, so important for us to sort of recognize that. And and thanks to your uncle for those wonderful images. To congratulate him, um, I um, you know there are quite a few examples, Anna. Um, you know, as Anubha was speaking, I remembered um, this wonderful uh, patient of mine who a young woman. Who's um, who doesn't really speak much? She's she's got schizophrenia for many years. She is not able to express her emotions, and so we kept wondering. I was very fond of her, and she was fond of me. And she would come to my clinic and just look at me for like fifteen minutes, hardly able to talk anything. Um, she was so anxious and so paranoid. And and then we sort of hit upon photography as a way of expression. And um, so the first thing she does is that when she comes to my clinic, all she does is she shows me her iPad where she's taken all these pictures and that's how we talk. So we say, okay, so you went to this park and tell me something about this. Why do you like this flower? Why did you take a picture of this particular flower bud or a leaf? Or, and she's simply amazing. And I've shown her pictures to some very seasoned photographers who did not believe that this was an outsider photographer. You know, I mean, they thought she was a professional and, and that's how we communicate. It's been, um, I think about 10 years and that's the only way we communicate with each other. We communicate through photographs, you know? So I think that, um, and her brother who was very encouraging has actually brought her a camera and, and that's all she does. She takes pictures and that's how she talks about. And I can make out her emotions based on her pictures and during COVID, they could not go out to take photographs. And I could see that her mood dipped, she became more paranoid, her hallucinations increased. And we really had to sort of, you know, figure out a way where the, she, so she's a nature photographer. She likes only nature. So we had to figure out how she can have a small balcony where she can take pictures of potted plants so that, you know, she can get through. So I think this is an amazing example of how very high doses of clozapine, which is the drug which we use for treatment resistance schizophrenia, were not working enough, but photography worked alongside medication, of course. And, and what Anna mentioned was that there are these collectives now of women with depression who actually come and do uh, sort of weaving together, you know, in groups. Uh, and that weaving and embroidery of sort of large scale uh, items or like fabric actually encourages them to talk to each other about stories. And in COVID, there's been a big movement about how to, um, how to symbolize grief, you know, uh, because grief has been so, like I mentioned, so inwards, uh, can we create pieces of art in different villages, in different communities? Where which kind of are a metaphor for the grief that has happened during COVID. And I talked about this to a group of uh, policymakers, and they have sort of started talking to artists uh, about the same, even in small communities to have like a, like a stone sculpture or a wall or, or a tree or, or whatever, you know, to kind of have something which actually uh, is a place where you can 
um, where you can express your grief. Um, there's a wonderful project in the UK called Hospital Rooms. It's been started about five years back and uh, they have a very nice page uh, on Instagram and, and, a, and a Twitter presence where this is a group of artists who got some money from sort of charities where they basically go to hospitals uh, like psychiatric facilities and do wonderful art. Uh, so th that could be, um, it could be paintings, it could be installations. Uh, they use various art forms and uh, they uh, involve the patients who are there and they create spaces where, you know, there's art in the hospital itself. Uh, and this is called hospital rooms. And I've been trying to see how we can have a similar organization in India, because otherwise the psychiatric facilities are so stark and so dreary. And when you're already so upset and um, down, the last thing you want to see is bare walls, gray walls. You know, you want to see something which will give you inspiration, give you hope. So I think these are such, I mean, um, I think there should be much, much more funding uh, for this. Theater is another art form which is very useful, uh, and of course, there's of course psychodrama, which is a which is a method of expressing emotions. But uh, many of the children who've lost grandparents during COVID, um, right now we're having a children's theater uh, festival going on. So we've tried to get some funding for these kids and actually have encouraged them to watch these uh, plays online. Uh, so that, uh, you know, theater acts as a method of uh, handling emotions related to grief. So I think there are, there are so many opportunities. I think it's about artists and professionals coming together to explore some of these, uh, you know, wonderful opportunities. So thanks for letting me share these. Yes, thank you for sharing those. It was wonderful. Yeah, very interesting to learn about all the ways that you're seeing art support people, which yeah. is very exciting. <laughs> I think the takeaway yes, message. I think the takeaway message from what uh, Anuba and Prabha have said is the self fulfillment, the self esteem that is enhanced by this, and the empowerment of people who otherwise are delegated to the lower ends of society. How the sense of accomplishment could, is is there, and I think the success has been mentioned. Uh, one one suggestion that I would give is with all these fascinating things that are going on around the world and in India, for instance, all the initiatives, that if TAP could do, consolidate these kind of best practices and share this around the world. Uh, and I have an opportunity where you could do that. Uh, and, and I think this would, would, would make people learn from people's experiences. I think, Anuba, what you mentioned in the psychoanalytic kind of uh, theater, I mean, these are rich in opportunities and um, creating a catalog of what can be done uh, would make life so much easier for so many other advocates and, and therapists. Yeah, because it can be intimidating, I think, for people if they don't consider themselves to be artists or whatever. And so they think, oh, well, that's not for me. Um, and so, yeah, hearing all of these examples and having a consolidated list, as you said, um, would be amazing because it would help to show people that like, oh, really, anyone can do this. It, it's not just reserved for people who consider themselves artists. Yeah, which would be uh, amazing. Dr. Chandra, I would love to see the works by your, uh, by your patient, if, if that's okay. Absolutely, I'll, I'll share the photographs. The and, you know. I, I'm sure uh, in the 2000s, I want to say there was this project in the uh, Bombay Red Light District where an organization had given children cameras, the children who lived in the Red Light District, in the yes. brothels. And you know that this was before we had the internet and like social media in such a big way. But I remember even then that whole project had gone kind of viral. You know, where uh, those kids had an exhibition of the works that they, uh, the photographs that they click in their homes and in their day to day lives. Yeah, that's amazing. So fascinating. I think I think I, I remember hearing that about that or something similar um, right. and just some really remarkable images coming coming from that. Yeah, which is amazing. And just proof that, um, you know, yeah, someone who's Un completely untrained and just picks up a camera or picks up a paintbrush. Also, or, yeah, um, you know, uh, like Mira Nair, the movie maker, she does these movies. Like she did Salam Bombay, which is uh, that's how we have the Salam Balak Trust come out of it. Uh, so 
the children that she works like whenever she needs to have like slum children in her movies or whatever she goes and gets real children like real slum children tra- uh, gives them art classes like trains them in theater and acting and gives them roles in movies and she she did that for salam bombay and uh, then she did it again for queen of katwe where she went into the slums in um, kampala to train these children and use them in her movies Wow. I think yes. uh, we are well into exceeding our time. <laughs> oh. Didn't even realize. Yeah. Huh? It went, sorry. It went sorry, so sorry. quickly. Time has just uh, flown oh, wow. when we are yes. having fun, right? Yeah. And um, so, uh, uh, so I think we should wrap up because um, I, I know while we want to talk, I'm sure a lot of uh, people have stuff to do on a Saturday evening. in india and a saturday morning here in canada so anna i have a suggestion i think we as a panelists have been doing a lot of talking but i think if rebecca can just open it out to anybody who can unmute themselves among the audience and just Ask. let them express and talk about what they've heard here what can be done better and if nobody volunteers uh, rebecca just call upon diane lada gita rao or leila Koshi to 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 speak. Yeah, Lila Koshi is my so sister, much. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? We could do it that way too. Yeah. If anyone has a question, they can just unmute themselves, or if there's just any comments that you would would like to make, please feel free to do that now. Don't be scared. <laughs> no questions. No. Uh, uh, excuse me. I am yeah. Kalpana Yuraj here from Artist Conclave Foundation. Sorry, I am not coming on the video because I just went through a surgery and I am recovering. I am an artist and uh, a therapist as well. I have been uh, conducting this art therapy program for the traffic victims in the Directorate of uh, Social Defense. and this has been you know there are girls aged 7 to 17 who have been kidnapped and abused sexually abused and then um, uh, really rescued by the government agencies and they are kept in kind of a juvenile home where people cannot meet them so artist conclave foundation we were permitted to go and see them and conduct some therapy programs and for the past 12 years we have been doing this and we see a lot of uh, changes in the attitudes of the girls because any product you give them first thing they want to do is to spoil it because that is the way they were handled when they were too young so i am looking for uh, some support from other people also you know other artists and therapists who can uh, you know join us in giving this kind of programs to juvenile homes and uh, uh, the traffic victims homes in chennai i have done this program in chennai in vellore and another home in kodaikanal which is being supported by mother teresa university so it was wonderful listening to all you panelists and uh, how art therapy works and thanks to dr prabha uh of sneha who has given a lot of inputs and who has been working with and when it comes to this kind of uh, giving therapy to juvenile homes and uh, you know this traffic victims i feel there are not much agencies or artists you know who are involved in these programs so if there is uh, any agency or any other organization or even a group of artists who would like to volunteer i would we would really appreciate this because we are only three people as of now so sometimes i take some singers and uh, so once we also conducted a psychodrama uh, we had invited the little theaters the children came and performed a drama and uh, this is what is happening but i am not completely satisfied with what we are doing because we need more helping hands i just thought i could share it here on this platform because you are all passionate therapists and artists as well thank you so much i'll oh. uh, post my uh, email id here for uh, your reference yeah you can please please post your email id and one of us will get in touch with you 
thank you thank you so much and appreciate uh, uh, tap so much sharon you are bringing in too much a lot of information and we are all sharing you know too many things during this pandemic and i enjoy every program of your sharon hot sap to you thank and you. any help, i'll be completely recovering in another two weeks time and any help you need please always get in touch with me i'm here thank you thank you so much and we'll try to see what we can do we'll try to get a few artists and see how we can put this together sure 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 i'm just giving you my email id here yeah put that in the chat and then um Diane said as well as she might be interested in finding out uh, how to help. So Diane as well, you can uh, yeah email her. Um, we did have one question that came in on the chat if we want to just quickly um, answer that. Um, so it says art is a therapy, but can it feed a stomach? How does one deal with this issue, especially during the pandemic? A lot of young artists and fashion professionals have lost jobs and businesses and have gone into depression. So how does art help them? Um, I can personally touch on this a little bit because as an actor, you know, my, that industry really got pretty much shut down <laughs> during COVID. Um, but I was still able to take, um, acting classes online. And I think, so for those of us who, uh, have a career in the arts, it's about more than just making the money. I have many other jobs, three or four in addition that make, that I can, you know, make a, make a living from. And, and that's how I feed myself and pay my bills. Um, so just being able to still engage in my art form, even if I wasn't making money in it, that was still incredibly supportive to me during the pandemic because it was just a relief. It provided a relief and an escape and it always has, acting always has for me. Um, and so it was a great blessing for me that Zoom and all of these, this wonderful technology we have now enabled me to still participate in acting classes. So that's how it helped me. Um, so I was still able to do other things for money, um, but I still wanted to have acting in my life because it was incredibly supportive to me mentally and emotionally. Anybody else? May, have I, may I just say something here? Uh, it has been a wonderful learning experience for me. And for addressing the question that here, people who get into depression, of course, they may have to seek help and really find out whether they are depressed or whether they are emotionally down. And while you all work with visual arts, while the other panelists have spoken about visual arts, I work at a very micro level. So if somebody is very disturbed and they don't have anybody to talk with, that's when they can come and you know they can ventilate and ours is a very non-directive approach that we use. So through talking, they actually find their own answers and solutions to cope with whatever situations they are going through. Of course, we may not be able to give them a livelihood and employment, but at least they will find ways by talking, okay, if this has gone, what else can I do? And this is what we have found extremely uh, rewarding for us because we've been able to empower people with whatever so, uh, uh, crisis they are going through, which is not uh, medicinal, which is not medical. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. That's, thank you for adding that in, Renu. If I can All also... Right. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go right ahead. It's okay. If I can also answer your question or the question too about artists and does it pay the bills? I don't think art ever pays the bills, truthfully, uh, an as an artist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think like you, uh, as an actress or an actor, um, you always have to do 15 other things. Um, <laughs> you always have to pivot in all kinds of different directions. Art is, um, unless you're a, maybe a Jackson Pollock or whoever else, uh, you're never going to pay the bills with art. Yeah. It's always going to be a joy, a sideline or whatever. Thank heaven for Zoom. Thank heaven for online sales. But it's really hard. And Absolutely. with COVID, people have not had extra cash. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, there are websites. You know, we've got a website. I've got a website. Um, I've... I'm part of a, an art group, so we've we've done online sales, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's never going to pay the bills. Yeah, 
Mm. Yeah, and I think that's the the um, one of the takeaways we can take from this is that art plays um, a much much more than just a financial role in people's yes. lives, especially in the context that we're talking about. It keeps here. us sane. Yeah. It keeps us it sane. Keeps us sane. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I couldn't agree And more. when you yeah. sell a piece of art, what it does is allow you to, to buy more art supplies to <laughs> make another right piece. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you for, for contributing that, Christine. Um, well, this has been absolutely uh, fantastic. Just the insights and the suggestions and the examples that, that everyone has contributed has been amazing. Um, and I'm sure that everyone watching at home found it uh, a helpful and supportive discussion. I know that I did. Um, so before we go, I just wanted to take a moment to invite everybody watching to participate in a free work uh, art workshop that um, that AIM and the Starfish Collective is holding. It's going to be a, a free two-day workshop over two Saturdays, August 14th and August 21st from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. IST, or that's 8.30 to 10 a.m. EST. They're, they're part one and part two, so it's not two separate sessions. It would be both days that you're participating in. Um, and uh, it's going to encompass visual arts, theater, and movement. It's going to be online, so you can just do it from the comfort of your home. Um, it is pretty limited in terms of participants. So if you are interested, make sure you email tapindiass at gmail.com by August 6th. So that's T-A-P-I-N-D-I-A-S-S -S at gmail.com. Um, so just email them and let you let them know that you're interested and they will get back to you with all of the details on that. Um, so I'd just like to once again extend a heartfelt thank you to everybody who participated in the discussion as a panel today or as an artist, um, everyone who is here watching and contributed questions. Um, I hope that uh, you all enjoyed the conversation. Everyone who's here is making an impact on the field of mental health and it's just so needed right now. Um, so thank you for that is as well. Um, and that's, that's all for me. Anna, is there anything else you'd like to add before we sign off? No, I just hope this is the first of many. And I know I have uh, Dr. Prabha, uh, who has said she's willing to participate in future series. So I've already got my brain going for the next session. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, everyone will participate. And I hope uh, Sharon will give me the platform to do this again. And uh, thank you all for joining. This is so important that we look after ourselves and be kind and compassionate to ourselves more than anything else. And for me, art has been huge. And I hope if anything you've taken away from this is that you don't need to draw a straight line. That's a comment that I get. Oh, I can't even draw a straight line. You don't need to draw a straight line because we are not straight lines, you know? We are crooked lines. Straight, straight so, lines are boring. <laughs> That's true. So I, I, I think this has been phenomenal. Thank you, uh, Anubhav, uh, Renu, Colin, Prabha, Rebecca, Sharon, Christine, Lata, and all of you who have taken time to participate in this event. Have a Thank wonderful day. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You. Take care. Nice to meet you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.